Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Brianna Kraft, and I'm going to kick us off, I think, now that we're at 11 o'clock. So official welcome to our webinar on loss and damage, research policy, and lived experience in least developed countries. It's so nice to have so many of you with us today. Um, thank you for introducing yourselves on the chat as you come in, 65 and counting. Great to see so much interest. Um, so as I said, my name is Brianna Kraft. I'm a senior researcher in the climate change group at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. I work to support the least developed countries in the UN climate negotiations, which I've been involved in since 2011. Um, and IID, just as background, is a policy and action research organization. We promote sustainable and equitable developments to improve livelihoods and promote or protect the environments in which those livelihoods are based. Um, we have offices in London and in Edinburgh, and I am speaking to you from London today. Um, we work with a wide range of partner organizations um, and a number of issues. My team works to support the least developed countries in the UN climate negotiations. We are co-hosting this webinar today with a partner organization in Bangladesh, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, and they will introduce themselves in a moment. So I'll just walk us briefly through our schedule. Uh, we'll start with some background from our partner organization, ICAT, uh, on their loss and damage program, as well as some scene setting with uh, Dr. Slimo Huck, who's been involved in the negotiations for a long time to kind of paint the picture of what is loss and damage and how has the concept evolved under the UNFCCC. Uh, after ICAD then introduces themselves, we'll move on to our panel discussion with our three panelists. We'll hear about lived experience of loss and damage in Rwanda from Ineza Grace. We'll hear about loss and damage research in Nepal from Manjeet Sekal. And we'll hear about the way forward on loss and damage in the climate negotiations, particularly in light of COVID from our final panelist, Shara Zalman. Uh, so we're very excited uh, to have such a great panel with us and a great partner organization. So that will kind of be our first real chunk of time together. And then we'll move on to um, some discussion uh, and questions and answers. We have some questions prepared for our panelists that we'd like them to address, and I'm sure you'll have questions for them as well. We've saved a significant chunk of time for that, so do please keep your questions coming uh, and I'll gear it up for that discussion. Um, so that will be our time together. Um, and again, if you have any technical issues or can't quite get through your to the question and answers or having some problems with the chat, do let us know and Matt can help you out with that. All right, so I'm seeing that participants are still coming in. If you came in a bit late, hi there, welcome. Uh, my name is Brianna Kraft. I'm a researcher at IIED and I am going to MC our webinar. Um, and we are going to start by introducing our partner organization, ICAD. So it's my pleasure to introduce Istiak Ahmed. Istiak manages both loss and damage and locally led adaptation and resilience programs at ICAD in Bangladesh. Um, and he currently leads four different projects under these programs. He has in-depth experience in social research and his different methodologies, particularly the environmental aspects of this research. And I'm going to hand over to him to give us some background on ICAD's loss and damage program. So Istiak, over to you. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Istiak Ahmed. I'm working as a program coordinator at the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ECAD, for the last five and a half years. So to give you a background of our loss and damage program, ICAD has been always working on the issue of loss and damage from the very beginning of its journey as an organization. We do research on loss and damage to better understand these different issues in the national context of Bangladesh. We publish different papers, blogs, briefs. We also uh, develop video documentaries to uh, make it available for the public understanding. We are also heavily involved in national uh, level advocacy Currently, we are working on uh, with the government to develop the National Mechanism for Loss and Damage together with Action Aid. We also facilitate discussion on the topic. We organize different webinars, seminars. We organize uh, different uh, courses so that we can have a wide range of discussion to understand this topic and kind of find a way forward. We also we are also involved in capacity building. Uh, we do different trainings on the topic so that people understand this topic better. And we are also about to start a new online course uh, on loss and damage. 
Uh, we also support, as Brianna said, IIED is also doing this. Uh, Dr. Hawk is supporting the LDC negotiator for long uh, when he was in IIED and still continuing this. As an organization, we are supporting that as well. Our colleague, uh, M. Hafiz Khan, he's the LDC negotiator on the track of loss and damage. So we also communicate with him regularly to understand the process. At the same time, how we can support them with different evidences. So yes, this is pretty much what ECAD is doing on the topic of loss and damage. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this webinar. We have a great uh, list of panelists and this is from everything, all from my side. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you very much. Thanks, Istiak. Um, and great to be working with ICAD on this topic, uh, given your range of expertise, long standing, and all the work you do in Bangladesh on this. So thanks very much. And as he said, we'll next hear from Dr. Salim Al Haq. Um, Salim is the director of ICAD um, and a senior associate at IID. Uh, he's an expert on the links between climate change and sustainable development, particularly from the perspective of developing countries. And as Istiak mentioned, he has supported the engagement of the least developed countries in the UN climate change negotiations for a long time. Um, so we're very pleased to have him introduce loss and damage and set the scene for us uh, in the context of the negotiations. So Salim, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Priyana, and uh, welcome to everybody at this uh, webinar. Uh, as you heard, my name is Salim al Haq. I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development. Uh, and we are a center based in Dhaka, Bangladesh, at, based at a university called the Independent University. And we are a, a think tank doing a lot of research and work on uh, the topic of loss and damage. Um, I've also been advising the least developed countries in the global negotiations under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change for many years on loss and damage. And I've been asked to give you a little bit of a, a short history of that particular track of the negotiations. So, Essentially, the issue of loss and damage arises when we have, and we un unfortunately have, failed to either mitigate sufficiently to prevent loss and damage or su adapt sufficiently to ensure that the losses are minimized. Uh, and in fact, the year 2020, which we are in right now, not only is going to be remembered for COVID-19, but is also, in my view, going to be remembered for being the year in which loss and damage from human-induced climate change is now something that is manifest and can be attributed and seen all over the world. Right now, the fires in California, for example, are definitely uh, attributable to the fact that global temperature has risen more than one degree uh, globally. And many other events around the world in Bangladesh, we have major floods going on at the moment. A couple of months ago, we had a super cyclone, Amphan, which again, you know, happens every 20 years or so, but this time happened uh, because of the elevated temperature in the Bay of Bengal. So the attribution of impacts from climatic events, which are natural to some extent, but get exacerbated and, and more severe because we have, as a collective global uh, community, raised the temperature of the global atmosphere, are now making these events more intense. And therefore the impacts and what we call loss and damage is now becoming a reality uh, as of this year. Um, historically, it was something that we thought would happen in the future, and we tried to discuss it in the negotiations, but it becomes a, in the, un, in the UN Framework Convention, it's a highly politically sensitive issue because loss and damage is seen by some of the countries that are responsible for the major emissions as trying to get compensation because of liability. So the words liability and compensation are taboo words for those countries. The polluting countries don't even allow us to use those words. We, the, the words liability, compensation cannot be used. And so loss and damage is a euphemism. And that's how negotiations happens. You find words that everybody can agree to, which have some vagueness of meaning, which others can, people can interpret in different ways. Uh, so in the 19th Conference of Parties, which happened in Warsaw, we did have a breakthrough where we had something called the Warsaw International Mechanism on loss and damage finally agreed. And that mechanism has been continuing. Last year in COP25 in Madrid in Spain, uh, there was an important element of that uh, loss and damage issue, a review of the Warsaw International Mechanism where the vulnerable developing countries, particularly the least developed countries and other vulnerable countries, we were pushing for 
the mechanism to be enhanced to have both a technical arm as well as a financial arm. Uh, we pushed very hard. Uh, we managed after 48 hours of extra time of COP25 to get the technical arm. It's called the Santiago Network on loss and damage, which is a good thing. But we failed to get the finance arm because, as I said, the polluting countries are vehemently against any kind of finance for loss and damage. We plan, I'm now speaking from the least developed countries and the other vulnerable country groups, to take this issue up in COP26, which now is, you know, has been postponed uh, to November next year instead of November this year in Glasgow uh, in Scotland, uh, hosted by the UK government. And so we are going to be pushing for the issue of finance to be raised again and discussed uh, beyond insurance. So at the moment, the only thing developed countries are willing to talk about is insurance. And there's quite a lot of insurance schemes going on, which are not bad. We are not against insurance. Our argument is insurance is not enough. It's not a panacea. It cannot deal with all the issues and particularly for the poorest people on the planet who can't pay for the premium to get insured. It just doesn't make sense. So we need to go beyond insurance of financing loss and damage. So that is effectively uh, where we stand at the moment uh, in the international negotiations. Uh, amongst our panelists, we have Manjit Dakal, who is one of the key negotiators who can also uh, reflect uh, uh, on his experience in that. Um, I must uh, beg leave because I have to attend another meeting at this moment uh, here in Dhaka. Our prime minister is opening a, a, a regional center on adaptation, which I need to participate in. So unfortunately, I won't be able to stay and answer questions, but my colleagues and other panelists will be able to do that. I'll stop there, Brianna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salim, um, and thank you for joining us, uh, given your busy schedule uh, and setting that scene uh, for loss and damage in the negotiations. So thank you. Um, before I move on to our panel, Salim actually raised a couple of points, which I might just quickly give some background. We keep mentioning the least developed countries group. Uh, the least developed countries group in the UN climate negotiations is the group of 47 of the world's poorest countries as classified by the UN. They are primarily in Africa, but they also reside in Asia and the Pacific and the one uh, LDC in the Americas is Haiti. Uh, they work together as a group in the negotiations and have since 2000. And they are currently chaired by the Kingdom of Bhutan, um, who, will, who has been chairing for the past two years. Uh, so led the negotiations in Madrid, as Salim was mentioning. Um, so those are the LDCs. Sorry to not explain that more fully earlier. Um, and yes, Salim raised some excellent points and we will delve into more depth and more detail on the negotiations uh, for the year ahead, particularly in Shara's presentation. Uh, so thanks very much for that. Uh, we'll now move on to our panelists. Now that we've heard from our partner, uh, ICAD and have introduced the concept of loss and damage a bit, giving you a flavor. So our panel will be three speakers. Uh, first to join us will be Ineza Grace. Uh, she is the CEO of a youth-led organization called the Green Fighter in Rwanda, uh, which she founded in 2017. She is an African eco-feminist environmental activist following the issues such as loss and damage and gender and climate change as discussed in the UN climate negotiations. She believes that youth inclusion in climate change solutions is our hope for sustainable development. Right on, Inesa. Um, and we're very happy to hear from you about your experience of loss and damage in Rwanda. So over to you. Thanks, Inesa. Hi, uh, thank you, Brianna. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us. Uh, as Brianna said, my name is Ineza. I'm, I'm speaking from Rwanda, which is in Africa, for those who don't know where, where Rwanda is. Um, so I'm very happy and glad and honored to be here to present uh, how we, as the youth, uh, uh, we are experiencing the loss and damage, but most importantly, sharing the case of uh, my country. For me, I think it's an honor. I, I thank you for giving me this opportunity. So um, I will start by uh, trying to explain what is loss and damage uh, because from I was introduced in, uh, in the climate change negotiation back in 2018. And I can be frank enough to say that I didn't know what loss and damage were at that time because uh, loss and damage and climate change impact are such as 
uh, such a mis misinterpreted uh, words that when you, you reach the negotiation, you can get lost. Uh, so loss and damage for me, um, I, I, I get to understand that the loss and damage are those impacts that are due to the climate change, but it's, it's late to, to be adapted for and also to be mitigated for, and uh, it kind of exposed the most vulnerable community in facing much more uh, climate change challenges in the, in the development. So back, back in, uh, in, in, uh, in our media or in uh, any of our communication structure, we tend to, uh, to put loss and damage as a kind of a natural disaster or man-made disaster when we are talking about it, which is, which is for me is a kind of the gap that is, uh, that is affecting either the awareness or our ability to, uh, to address it in our, in our context. So back speaking on, on Rwanda, uh, Rwanda, we, we are, we are a, a tropical country. And recently, we've been experiencing a high intense rain, which, uh, which caused death and the destruction of infrastructure, infrastructures and uh, some other irreversible uh, disasters. But what, what we are talking about is like, uh, it's kind of affects uh, the economic pile of our country, this agriculture, because uh, the rain, the rain is it, uh, it's on a high intense. We have an soil erosion, and our our crops are, destroy, are destroyed, and we have many people being exposed uh, to food uh, it's like food security, and we also have our community are not aware enough of how to to adapt on that change or to how to to better cope with it because uh, our 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 every running system are not that uh, strong enough to predict all the intensity and the the, the natural for the impact of the rain and we can understand because it's a is a using a using a tool to de to define what the nature gonna cause so i can see i can say that whether the system gonna work there's uh, some of uh, natural surprise that we can get um, but the most important thing is that the loss and damage is affecting uh, women and girls, especially in the rural area. A reason being that uh, in our culture, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a general culture, not only in Rwanda, there's some of the household uh, activity that's uh, that, uh, attributed to women. Uh, from here, it's like uh, fetching wood for cooking and cooking food. So when when the the rain is is intense and the crop is destroyed, so and everywhere and the, the forest is uh, dry, I mean wet. So we kind of we kind of get uh, more women exposed to face uh, uh, their their household level not being able to, to provide food or get enough energy for cooking, which also uh, I, which also is uh, impacted on one sense. Um, for the youth, for the youth in the climate, uh, for the, in the climate action, I believe uh, uh, this is a time where we, we need to showcase our ability and we can show it in terms of, uh, for example, advocacy, trying to, to raise the voice of the voiceless on the table where the, the decisions are made, um, trying to come up with stories, uh, storytelling, to, so that we can share uh, the experience of our community and also trying to design our our solution the solution in our own context so uh for for example speaking of uh, sharing my experience um i came to i came to know the loss and damage back when i was in negotiation in the last cop that's when uh i, I was introduced to the loss and damage and i came to realize that this is such an untapped issue uh, and that need really consideration either at or the convention, even on our national level, because it's impacting uh, our well-being, even our ability to be uh, a developed country. So when 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 I was into the negotiation, I came to realize that uh, me me as the youth, maybe I'm not capable enough to to make a policy demand or anything, but still I can try to 
to do what I can to, uh, to decrease the vulnerability of my community in my own context. That's why I, I was really eager to share what, 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 I, what we are feeling here in Rwanda on the global scale so that we can even give information so that people can understand what's really need to be done. And most of the time, it's not, we don't need to do much. We can do, do less with a very um, strategic plan on impact, which can uh, later facilitate uh, the, the, the development of much bigger thing. So today, what we are trying to do, uh, as I say, we are trying to write story and we can publish as a blog or story or anything. Uh, but also we want to, to showcase that we are ready to work with uh, the youth, the global youth. We are really ready to work with partners, but who are ready to listen and hear and nurture our ability and commitment for future, uh, to decrease the future impact of climate change. Thank you. Thanks, Ineza. Thanks so much. Um, really difficult topic, but you really painted a picture of how widespread the issue is and how many layers of impacts you're experiencing there in Rwanda. Um, deaths to intense rain, food insecurity, the impacts on women and girls in rural areas, impacts on youth, um, and yeah, the impacts of Rwanda's development. Uh, all kind of sit within this topic. So well done in capturing all of that and really giving us a lot to think about in terms of how loss and damage is impacting people. And I am particularly excited to hear um, the youth telling their own stories and how this issue is affecting them. And thank you for being the first uh, to tell us. So well done. Thanks, Ineza, for that. Um, so we'll save questions to you for our discussion. So we'll move on to the next two panelists first, and then we'll have some questions and answers. So our next panelist joining us is Manjeet Dekal. So Manjeet uh, is the head of LDC support team at Climate Analytics, um, and also serves as an, as an advisor to the chair of the LDC group, Bhutan, in the climate negotiations. Uh, he provides technical inputs and analysis to the chair and members of the LDC group um, and he played a key part in the LDC's efforts that led to the negotiation of the Paris Agreement in 2015. Manjeet's been in the climate negotiations for a long time and I've had the privilege of working with him there. Um, Manjeet is also associated with the School of Environmental Science and Management at Pokhara University in Nepal as an adjunct faculty for climate change and he regularly writes, teaches and presents on climate change related issues. So we're very pleased to have you Manjeet to discuss loss and damage research in Nepal. So over to you. Thanks, Manjeet. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, so the introduction has already been done. Uh, I will not uh, take time further, but really impressed with uh, what Inisa said earlier. And, and please uh, take that. Uh, the youth have a huge potential. Uh, please don't, don't feel that you cannot provide a policy guidance or policy advice. Uh, I think that's the area where it should come from. And then on the topic that we are here today uh, on discussing on loss and damage, I think this is an important area uh, where the youth have to make a contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me start by, by a very brief context uh, of where I'm coming from uh, and then how this issue relates uh, in, in, in Nepal. Uh, it's clearly, uh, we, we hear uh, during, during this month of the time and, and just before this, uh, there are a number of events, a number of extreme events uh, that, that we face uh, in, in, in the South Asian country. And, the, and the, the event, the extreme or any kind of slow onset event are not contained by the political border. Uh, every time we, we have these events, uh, the, the flood, uh, the country in the region, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, uh, Bhutan, uh, the countries have a huge damage, and, and it's, it's not an issue that one country is only facing. Uh, if we talk about the, the glaciers uh, in the Himalay, uh, just on this, the, the report was published yesterday uh, from, uh, from EC Mode and, and, and UNDP, which confirmed uh, the number of glaciers that we have and, and the potential of, of damage, of, of outbursting them uh, anytime soon, which also creates a, a huge uh, consequence, uh, a possible consequence in, in the region. When we talk about the, the specific Nepali society, the Nepali farming society, uh, the population has a very low capacity 
uh, when it comes to the, the responding to, adapt the, the, to the, the climate impacts uh, and, and, and building resilience. The, some of the, the government report has also confirmed that uh, more than 80% of the extreme events that we face uh, are triggered by drought, flood, landslide, extreme temperature, glacial leak, outburst flood, which are climate related events. All these also uh, uh, highlight that the, the, the lack of hydrometeorological data, the lack of data sharing in the region, uh, the, the lack of research that we had, and, and, and the lack of uh, having a long-term uh, analysis uh, to, to fit to the policy process uh, makes a difficulty uh, in, in terms of uh, having any suggestion in terms of the policy process. So that's where we are. Next slide. Uh, yeah. So this was a very preliminary analysis that I did uh, looking at the uh, the annual, uh, looking at the, the live portal that we have in Nepal called the RR portal, uh, which uh, kind of presents the list of uh, list of disasters, uh, which are not necessarily the climate related disaster, uh, but combined, uh, it also has a list of uh, earthquake, uh, snake bite, a uh, number of other accidents. So what I did here is I, I tried to put together the two events, flood and landslide, which are more uh, related to uh, climate, uh, climatic events, and the death caused by these two events. So looking at the data from 2011 to 20, here you can see uh, in the first graph for each of the year, the number of the incident that has happened, uh, landslide and, and flood. And in the next graph, the death caused by two respective events, uh, which obviously uh, is, in, is, is, is not in a real, uh, I think, I think uh, doesn't really show us a, a clear trend, but number of reports, including the Nepal disaster report published in 2019 has confirmed that uh, among other Landslide and flood uh, are, those, are the events that has claimed more life. Uh, so this clearly uh, shows how, how, how the situation is uh, in terms of the facing this disaster. And, this, and when we talk about the, the death uh, is, is, is not something that can be recovered and it's not something that can be economically valued. Next slide. Uh, in this one slide, I've, I've tried to put together the, some of the some of the studies uh, that has been uh, done in Nepal. Uh, most of them are the case studies in this specific area, in this specific district. Uh, some relates to the flood, some looking at the landslide, uh, some trying to uh, analyze the, the economic uh, impact uh, of, of those impact, uh, and, 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 and some trying to help uh, the, the local development planning uh, in terms of how, how, the, how this, uh, how, how they, they can, they can respond uh, to the, to the residual impact, to the, to the, to the events that cannot be recovered uh, as such. Uh, these are only the case studies. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the NDC that Nepal has submitted in 2016 has also prioritized a loss and damage research, not, not as something that the country can contribute, but has highlighted uh, a, a, uh, to, to focus uh, on, on, the, on the loss and damage research uh, so that it helps in terms of development planning, it helps in terms of policy process. I have not good detail in terms of this study, but as, 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 I, as, I, as I said earlier, uh, these, are, these are the selected uh, study that are focused on loss and damage. The attribution of this study are still uh, to be discussed. Uh, the whole methodology, I think we can still discuss, but these are some of the studies uh, that, that has been done in Nepal. Uh, that, that respond directly to, to loss and damage. The next slide. <clears throat> so just to conclude, uh, in, so looking at what, what it has been done in Nepal in terms of the studies, uh, which has only covered a very few area, as I said earlier, few relating to uh, the landslide or the flood, uh, uh, not much we have been able to do uh, relating the loss and damage to uh, either the glacier lake outburst or, or the, or the long-term impacts in terms of rising temperature. Uh, so this, this all clearly shows the, the need to promote the scientific uh, uh, observation and the research and the assessments that are required in the future. Uh, this also clearly shows the need of research and study that can strengthen the attribution to climate change, which uh, is always difficult 
because of the, the data availability, because of the methodology, and, and because of the, the concept itself, uh, which is that moment when the loss, when the adaptation is stops and, and the loss and damage starts. Uh, and and as some of the studies that I have presented earlier are also the 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 uh, the case studies done by my students. Uh, where uh, we also have faced a lot of challenge in terms of data availability and and, uh, and the attribution part. Uh, also, the uh, it is extremely important to to strengthen the hydrometeorological station and the data processing and the and the capacities for the the vulnerable countries uh, to analyze this data to help uh, the, the long term observation, uh, so that we can we can strengthen the research capacity. For all this, uh, it's it's equally important to mobilize support from the international community to build the the, the capacity in terms of research and assessment, but equally uh, in terms of preparedness, immediate response, and the long term uh, planning for for the for the events. Uh, in this, I just want to highlight the the, the point that I have been raising in, in most of the events when I talk about the loss and damage. When the extreme events happen. Uh, we will not have time to to write a proposal for the funding mechanism and 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 tell that community that please wait we are writing a proposal it will be approved by our national system then we'll submit it to the multilateral or some international agency and then we'll come back that's we don't have that luxury and the and and what it has been what has been happening as of now is the the countries who are in need the countries who have prioritized the funding for the development needs have been uh, using the same funding to respond to those immediate needs. So I think the, the whole international financing architecture has to be looked from that context as well. And just to conclude, uh, it is extremely important uh, to, to have a, a, a regional perspective, to have a regional process that helps in terms of data sharing, that helps in terms of planning, that helps in terms of preparedness, because it's not only about doing something after the event, but also uh, the early warning system and a lot of other things that can be done before uh, and most important, the, the immediate response that has to be done uh, when the event happened. Uh, I will I will conclude here, and if there is anything, any questions, I'll come back later. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Manji. Quite a comprehensive presentation um, to go from the impacts of Nepal to the research that you're doing to try and understand them more fully and really the, the further study needed to a um, <laughs> figure out the line between where the threshold for adaptation stops and loss and damage begins, but also have the collaborative data to really paint a picture of that. Um, very interesting. And I certainly have questions of my own on that. So looking forward to further discussion of those topics. But thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we'll save the questions. I see them coming through. Thanks very much, everyone, um, for writing in your questions and upvoting them as appropriate. Um, so please do keep them coming. We'll save them for our, the end for our discussion. And it's my pleasure to introduce our last panelist. Uh, so Shara Zaman uh, is an environmental lawyer and academic based in Bangladesh, working to promote environmental and climate justice. Shara has also engaged in the UN climate change negotiations and she began there in 2017 on issues of compliance and mitigation on behalf of the LDC group. Um, we're very happy to hear from Shara on the way forward in the climate negotiations for loss and damage in light of COVID and everything that's happened. Um, obviously, the negotiating schedule has changed quite a bit this year, as everything else has. So kind of what's going to happen on the way to COP26, which is now, as Salim mentioned, at the end of next year, but still in the UK. So Shara, I will hand over to you. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Priyani. Uh, thank you so much. And very good afternoon from Dhaka. So, and also thanks uh, to the my previous two speakers, Inisa and Manjit, for setting the ground uh, very clearly. It actually makes my life quite easy. Um, I was actually listening to them very carefully. And um, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, loss and damage is something uh, that uh, now, I mean, it's visible around the world. I mean, Dr. Salimul Haq, um, he just briefly touched upon some of the very recent incident. I would also like to add, like currently, excessive monsoon floods are happening in South Asia. Almost 75 million people have been affected by flooding in India, Bangladesh. Nepal, California is burning 
we recently experienced cyclone Amphan, especially in Bangladesh and India. Uh, also, we have experienced Australian wildfire, East Africa drought, Central America's dry corridor is into a six year of drought. So these are the what uh, the reality that uh, that we are uh, coming across. Uh, I mean, uh, from like past fifteen years. And I strongly believe that LDC has the opportunity to push for the issue of loss and damage for climate change to be made a central topic for discussion at COP26. This is quite a political sensitive issue that goes well beyond meeting, which have been the main focus of climate change conference until now. Uh, however, um, uh, to before uh, we jump in uh, to that, how we can um, uh, make our way forward for COP26, I like to briefly discuss what we actually so far achieved uh, uh, in the matter of uh, loss and damage in COP25. Uh, to be very honest, we do have some substantive wins here. In COP25 decision, we uh, reviewed Warsaw International Mechanism. Parties agreed uh, to review BIM uh, again in 2024 and after every five years. COP decision established a new expert group on action and support to help countries to access expertise on slow onset events. Um, the, decision strengthened the link of BIM with SCF and GCF. It also established San Diego Network, which Dr. Salim was referring, a technical and implementation arm for WIM. But at the same time, we do have uh, quite a good number of contentious issues as well on the matter of uh, loss and damage in COP25, uh, which we literally and critically need to take as a note for COP26. Uh, in COP25, there was no conclusive decision on finance arm of WIM, uh, which the LDC um, and also G77 China Group was strongly pushing for. And there was no consensus to specifically refer the developed countries' obligation to provide new and additional finance. No concrete timeline agreed to operationalize the San Diego network. Most importantly, no resolution passed in the matter of the governance issue of WIM. So, uh, I mean, uh, these are the uh, really uh, contentious issues that we really need to critically take into consideration for COP26. Now, how, I mean, uh, the current pandemic, um, I mean, COVID-19, how um, affect the schedule um, of uh, this year, I mean, um, this year 2020. COVID-19 not only postponed the SB52 session twice, it's already been uh, postponed for two times. It also pushed COP26 for next year, but this is not uh, all. I mean, by the end of this year, the WIM executive committee is supposed to establish expert group which is supposed to develop a focus, uh, uh, a focus plan of action concerning uh, finance source of support collaboration outreach risk management, especially to support the establishment of link between XCOM, SCF, and GCF. Uh, the expert group also um, required to form for the slow onset events and non-economic loss, taking into account the broad range of issues covered by relevant strategic work stream, which may need to be uh, addressed using a sequential approach. By this year, San Diego Network also needed to operationalize, especially uh, we need to articulate its structure, role, functioning, uh, so that it can provide technical assistance to the developing countries to report on their progress to the XCOM. But unfortunately, due to um, COVID-19, I mean, um, nothing, um, not much progress has happened on all these listed issues that I just mentioned. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, when we actually, uh, when the COP25 was ended, uh, we were very much looking forward for COP26, uh, in fact, uh, for uh, 2020, because 2020 is supposed to be a pivotal year for the, this sort of effort to address loss and damage. But the coronavirus uh, right now thrown a, the whole process into a quite uh, an uncertain situation. However, uh, the coronavirus crisis can um, are uh, also it's uh, threatening the national, local, and uh, effort to meet the climate commitment that had already been made. 
But um, as a uh, climate activist, uh, I would like to see this crisis also as an opportunity, especially the delay can be used to prepare more efficiently for COP26 so that we can effectively uh, make an outcome uh, through COP26. In this case, uh, I mean, we also uh, need to uh, know by COP21 what target we actually need to achieve. Uh, especially from uh, my point of view, uh, in COP26, we really need to resolve green governance issue. We need to fill up the finance gap. We need a finance facility under the green based um, both on compensatory and distributive justice principle. We also need to scale up the technical support for loss and damage activities. We further need to progress um, in the matter of um, operationalizing the wind and also the Santiago network. So keeping all these target uh, in mind, we need to uh, make COP26 as an action COP. We really need to make it as an action COP. And uh, uh, to make uh, COP26 as an action COP, uh, my strategic recommendation would be, we really need to identify and bridge the gap that undermine the progress at COP25. Uh, this responsibility to bridge the gap now really falls heavily on all the parties' shoulders, especially um, uh, to LDC and SIDS who are really pushing hard uh, to uh, uh, take the loss and damage discussion further. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and postponement of COP26, giving also a sufficient space to resolve the contentious issues, UK as the incoming chair should take with all the relevant countries as well as civil societies and try to come in, in COP25. And uh, last but not the least, uh, we need to unite, keep our united position, especially among developing country of G77 and China, uh, so that um, we can effectively uh, uh, make sure that what we demand uh, can actually come out in COP26 decision. So yeah, uh, I mean, that's overall from my side and very much looking forward to hear your uh, question and comments in that regard. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Shara. Excellent presentation um, and painting the picture of where the negotiations stand, even with the COVID effects. And I admire your optimism and seeing COVID as an opportunity, uh, I hope we will take it that way. And I like the framing of COP26 needing to be an action COP, uh, particularly in regards to loss and damage to finalize some of these things that didn't happen uh, when we were in Madrid um, around governance of the Warsaw International Mechanism on loss and damage, finalizing the Santiago Network on loss and damage to get it operational, et cetera. Um, and thanks for reminding everyone um, that the G77, so the group of 77 in China, um, probably the largest negotiating bloc in the negotiations, has a single position on loss and damage and negotiates together in the climate negotiations. Um, so great to have set that, that picture for all of us. Thanks very much. Um, all right, so I'm seeing lots of questions coming through. Thanks very much to everyone uh, for sending those questions in. We're going to move on to our discussion and questions and answers now. So please do um, write them down if you have any more. Uh, I'm gonna kick off this uh, portion by asking a pre-prepared question, one that I wanted to have asked to our panelists um, and get their views on this. So my question is, your presentations have demonstrated that loss and damage is a multi-layered challenge. We have Aneza, who's broken down some of the local issues. We've got Manjit, who's talked about his national context, and then Shara talking about the international context. There's a lot going on. Uh, so to our panelists, what, in your opinion, is the most important action that be can be taken to address loss and damage on any of these fronts? What is most important to you? Um, so I'm going to turn it over. Maybe we'll hear from Manjit, then Aneza, then Shara to answer those que that question. And then we'll also, then we'll start taking the questions from our audience. So over to you, Manji. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, and, and that's an excellent question. I think uh, there are also some other uh, participant who has asked the similar question. So I think we can address uh, this collectively. Uh, I think the first and the foremost is we don't want a loss and damage, a situation to reach to that extent. 
uh, I think I think that should be our main objective. Uh, we we don't want to get prepared for the loss and damage. That means don't take it otherwise. That means we don't want a situation to get to that level, which means the the global temperature rise has to be limited. And as per the Paris Agreement, to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, even in 1.5 degrees Celsius, we we will be facing a residual losses. So if the temperature keeps on rising. Uh, the situation, the, the, the adverse impact of climate change that we are facing in our countries will be worse. So in that case, I think it's, it's, it's a high time uh, that uh, a countries with the highest emission, uh, as well as the other, as well as the, uh, the, the, the other countries who can show the leadership uh, must take uh, this action uh, so, that, uh, so that the other can follow the leadership. Uh, I think that's that's the first and the foremost. The second would be uh, the countries to 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 focus more on 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 planning. Uh, the countries to focus more in 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 terms of uh, strengthening the system in the country itself uh, to respond and 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 so that uh, this any 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 extreme events happen. Uh, any uh, and it's not only about the any extreme events, but also the respond to the slow onset events. Uh, and I think that the third point would be about uh, the, the the support mechanism. And as I said earlier, there were some of the remarks uh, in the question itself uh, about uh, whether the, the current established financial mechanism are, are fine to address that system or not. Uh, how can the Santiago network that, that and, and the other finance related uh, the sub institution that are found under the WIM can help with this. So I think these are some of the work that are work in progress. Uh, but I think the first and the foremost, let's have a situation where we don't have to face loss and damage. Thank you. Excellent, excellent points. Um, thanks for your comprehensive answer. And it's lovely to see your audience there on the screen as well. So welcome to them too. Uh, Anesa, over to you for your thoughts. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, for me, in my perspective, I think the most important action is to invite the youth in the climate sector and uh, to, allow, to allow them to acknowledge the past mistake that, uh, that lead us to the situation that we are currently experiencing and together try to, uh, they can listen to us and understand our plan of making the solution in our own innovative and uh, um, innovative and uh, impactful way that we understand, and uh, they can, they can, they can try to uh, increase the capacity of uh, the youth to deliver a uh, solution. So that would be meaning like uh, the youth will be present and get information and learn how to actually use the information, and at the same time they can be, uh, they can be empowered to make actual solution in the community where the, 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 uh, the partners and the national will actually be risk, risking to, to trust the youth ability to deliver uh, concrete results in terms of uh, adapting on uh, the loss and damage in the, in the country uh, perspective on the national and international level. That, that is my most important thing. That's because I think in that, in that way, we can ensure that we are moving on uh, on a clear forward path where we, don't, we will not be able to come back again to check other mistakes that we, we, we encountered because we'll be working together by acknowledging the mistake we are living currently and trying to work together in, in developing some stable solution uh, that is tackling the both generation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, great answer. I love the youth focus um, and does make a lot of sense on this particular issue. Uh, Shara, over to you. Uh, thank you, Brianne, for the question. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very uh, important one from an international perspective. And uh, my uh, suggestion or answer would be extremely brief. I strongly believe uh, that uh, we are done with our technical negotiation uh, on the matter of loss and damage. So uh, now, right now, we are stuck in, in a kind of position. We cannot move further by pushing it from the technical perspective. Now we need to go strongly with the political negotiation. We really need to uh, make our political leaders, I mean, uh, from the indices perspective, 
LDC political leaders need to really bring this issue further to the all people or all the countries who are actually creating block in this regard. Uh, as uh, Manjit says uh, rightly that uh, we cannot let the loss and damage happen. We don't have the luxury, even at the negotiation table, uh, to just to wait and uh, to push it and to wait for another COP and another COP. No, we don't have that time. So right now, we really need to push the issues through political negotiation. We need to push it very hard so that uh, all the black block blockage can be removed and we can really achieve something constructive, something substantive. Uh, in COP26. So that's my suggestion, uh, to focus more on political negotiation uh, so that we can achieve some, something really substantive in this regard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great answer. Um, and yes, the frustration with the kind of technical side and not being able to move unless there's political will has certainly been felt for a long time in the negotiations. So I think you're absolutely right there. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, we're, we have so many questions coming in. We're gonna move to our participants' questions and I'm gonna take the top three questions uh, first that have been upvoted. So number one was, we heard from Salim that insurance isn't enough uh, when it comes to finance for loss and damage. What other forms of financing have been most useful to individuals and communities that are impacted by irrevocable climate change is the question. Um, so this is open for any of our panelists to answer. Uh, and also if uh, representatives from ICAT are still with us, Istiak, um, I think, I don't think Salim's still on the line, but just in case, uh, the question is open to anyone who would like uh, to answer from our panel. Um, so I might just check with Manjeet if you would like to go first, um, but otherwise you're welcome to come in. Rihanna, I'm, I'm still here. Salim, can I? Yes. Take that. I've been I've been listening one one in each year <laughs> to two <laughs> different events. Uh, incidentally, the GCA has just been launched by the Prime Minister, so that's uh, events over. Um, so the question uh, regarding uh, what beyond insurance is in a a number of ideas have been floated, uh, particularly from civil society, um, and one of the stronger ones, which I believe the time has come for all of us to now uh, move towards is to uh, levy a tax on the polluters. And it is not a very difficult thing to do because there's only about 60 to 70 big fossil fuel companies around the world who account for well over 80% of global emissions from coal, oil, and natural gas. And they make billions of dollars in profits every year from selling this product. So we can put a tax on them and we can make them pay even a small percentage of the profit that they make would raise a huge amount of money for loss and damage. And it doesn't mean governments and taxpayers have to put the money in. We make the polluters pay. It, the principle is very simple. Uh, morally, I think it's absolutely justified. Politically, it's extremely difficult. And so that's really what we have to fight in the negotiations is to get civil society and citizens on our side to force governments to agree to do that. Governments can easily agree to do it. If they agree, it happens overnight. Um, and I'll, I'll end by just citing an example. It isn't from Klaus and Damage, but it is from the travel, uh, airline travel industry. The French government imposes, and has been doing for a number of years, a tax on airline passengers. I think it's about five euros or 10 euros per ticket. Anybody in, in France who buys a ticket for, on, to travel by air, they don't even know they're paying for it, but they are paying a tax. And that tax goes not to climate change, it goes to the Gavi Fund, the health fund, to help on HIV and other health issues, which when this was a big issue. At that time, the French government decided to make airline passengers help them pay the French contribution for dealing with this global, at that time, that was the major pandemic. And so, uh, levying on the airlines is another very good way of raising some money on polluters, even though nowadays airline traffic has been uh, ha <laughs> hindered by COVID. But nevertheless, airline passengers are another polluting sector who could be easily taxed uh, to put in an air airline passenger levy for loss and damage. So there are a number of ideas floating around there that we can look at, but we need to start looking 
at innovative ways of financing loss and damage. Mm. Excellent. Thanks, Salim. And yeah, I start, while you were talking, there has number of airlines have all, uh, implemented something like that where you pay a, a donation, um, but essentially a tax uh, when you book your ticket as well. So these, these aren't completely radical, unheard of Absolutely. ideas that have existed exactly. for a long time. Correct. And certainly the concept that polluters pay is something we all learn when we go through environmental studies courses. This is not radical. Um, so thanks for bringing that up and making it so clear. Any other of our panelists who would like to talk about other financing options um, other than insurance that would be most useful to individuals or communities impacted by irrevocable climate change? Yeah, uh, just Brianna, just to add, I think uh, we can we can look at this two two aspect. One uh, for when when we when we talk about the the country like countries like ours, uh, the support for the country to help. Uh, assessing the loss and damage itself. And, and for that, uh, some of the existing opportunity that the funds that are available can be assessed, but those funds are not enough when we have to implement action. And I think in that context, uh, it's extremely important to look at these avenues. Uh, the, the, the oversight should also be there for the public finance, uh, the, the, the very important uh, and innovative thoughts that Salim had shared earlier. Uh, so I think, uh, and, and, and in the UNFCC discourse, uh, some of this discussion has initiated as well through the uh, the arm that has been formed uh, under the under the XCOM and under the WIM, uh, but but uh, but for the vulnerable community, uh, uh, a community in Bangladesh or Nepal or Bhutan, uh, as, as Sara also said earlier, I think we don't have that luxury of time that people are negotiating and they will find an option of appropriate mechanism and and then the the situation will be addressed. Uh, so I think this this context has to be always kept in mind when when we are when the, the world is negotiating uh, uh, trying to negotiate on, on this uh, on the situation that these countries and the communities are facing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Manji. Yes, Shara. Well, I um, I just like to add like um, as Manji referred for uh, multi donor funds. Uh, I would rather uh, would like to refer it as a multi donor trust fund. Uh, where we can actually accumulate funds from various uh, donors, um, like public and private sector. But the most important thing is we actually need a dedicated fund for loss and damage, uh, which should be uh, under the WIM mechanism. I mean, right now, we have, under the San Diego network, we have a technical and implementation arm. We really, to make it more functional, we need really, really need a dedicated fund for loss and damage. And uh, I think uh, from my perspective, a multi-donor trust fund might be helpful, which can collect uh, uh, resources from various sources, like as Salim Nuhasar said, like from uh, yard plane levy, or it can be from other donors or public or other private sectors. Thanks. Thanks, Shara, for adding another option to consider. Uh, and Aneza, I think you wanted to come in as well. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, for me, um, I just have a, a small idea based on what Dr. Salim and ha has been talking. I was thinking like maybe we can make an advocacy in the negotiation framework of the UNFCC so that we can have a kind of a fund that is, uh, that is uh, specific for the loss and damage uh, in the sense that we, we have one for adaptation why not having one for the loss and damage? And we can we can look on a global mechanism where, um, like they said, an example of in France, how people are, are paying a, a plane ticket and paying for some carbon taxes. Uh, maybe we can globally make something that everyone who is living on on Earth can uh, actually contribute in in uh, in uh, in that in the fund of the loss and damage under the convention. And the convention can actually work with the on-ground policymaker, actors, civil society who are uh, who are working on how to uh, to adapt and uh, cope with the changing of climate, but most most importantly, working with the uh, vulnerable communities. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, ma many options to think about. Lots of finance that's needed. Lots of channels to think through, and who pays also. Very important consideration. 
Um, I'm going to move us on to our next question as we've got some good ones coming through. This one is more about the, these mechanisms in the negotiation. So looking at that. So the question is, it's many parts. The technical arm of the Santiago network was mentioned earlier. Uh, what kind of actions does it provide? Does it, for example, address data collection gaps that Manjeet mentioned? And what are the sources of finance? to provide for these capacity building needs. So several questions. I know we've touched on some of this, um, but maybe Shara, if you can have a first crack uh, at answering some of those, and then we can move on, particularly to the question aimed at Manjeet. Thanks, Priyani. Um, actually, I mean, uh, the Santiago network, uh, the, as part of the decision on COP25, uh, it should be an implementation or technical arm to support B, uh, Washington National Mechanism. But uh, what should be its structure, what would be the specific role and functioning of it, it's not uh, very much settled down yet. This is what it, it should uh, be articulated by this year, but due to the COVID-19, we didn't progress much on this regard. But definitely it will uh, work more like a technical and um, implementation arms of BIM uh, to, uh, uh, and uh, various uh, technical support uh, might come up throughout this network, which will eventually feed the developing countries uh, to prepare their report to the XCOM. So this is the basic idea, but how it's going exactly going to uh, work it out is uh, yet to be decided. And also the finance part, uh, I mean, uh, so from my understanding, it doesn't have any uh, finance uh, shell support yet. It will just work uh, as a technical and implementation part of BIM. Uh, but um, I mean, during COP25 negotiation, though, uh, countries push for a financial arm as well, but uh, which we failed to achieve there. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I know the finance portion of that discussion will definitely continue, as you mentioned. Um, so then, Menji, I don't know if you want to address, um, if you foresee the Santiago network helping to address some of the capacity building gaps in terms of information collecting, um, or what your vision for that might be. Um, I think that's uh, that's still evolving, uh, and and uh, there is much uh, to do to build a system in the country itself. Uh, I think this is a uh, the way uh, the COP decision has been made. Uh, this uh, the, the the organization who has been now listed uh, in the network uh, would help or countries uh, to to build to build on and, and countries to stay forward to build their capacity. But but I think uh, at the end uh, the 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 in-house capacity of the country has to be strengthened uh, so that the capacity remain in the country itself. Uh, and 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 will will address a long term uh, the 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 gap that the countries are facing. Uh, so I think there is much to do, uh, but I think this is a good start. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, do any of our other panelists want to come in on the Santiago network or kind of the vision for what it could be could be doing? If not, I'll move in move on to the next question. All right, next question. Um, top voted, what are the biggest gaps in data at the moment? What methods are used at the moment to monitor the events induced by climate change worldwide? And last is social media used to understand on the ground views of local people as to how they experience climate change. So big question, um, but mostly about how data is collected and methods used to monitor a climate change event. So who would like to kick things off? I wonder if Anesa, you might want to start talking about social media and how you use that in the green cipher. Um, but of course, open to all our panelists. Uh, okay. Um, for me, um, I really think that uh, the media plays a big role in, uh, in even making possible to collect data because they are the one who, uh, who are present uh, within the community on a, I can say on a daily basis. But what we need to know is that uh, our media coverage system need to understand uh, or to be empowered on how to, uh, to collect essential data, which are informative either on the policy side, or even on the civil society. 
So what we are trying to do right now in the Green Fighter is we are trying to come up with a with a platform where we can share our story in, in terms of blog. We can uh, we 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 can train a couple of youth from different perspectives or different location in Rwanda, even in Africa. They can try to write a story on how these uh, on how the loss and damage are being felt in their own context and try to come up with what's what their actual recommendation. And from the recommendation, we were thinking that we, we can deliver something that would be uh, meant to empower the media, the social media on the, on the local perspective, but also trying to influence um, the proper data collection on, uh, on the side of uh, who, who, who wants the data and who's collecting data, and also trying to make sure that the community know exactly that we are trying to understand their pain and we, we, we are eager to make something, uh, to make a solution toward um, making it not more uh, harsh as they are feeling right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent effort um, and some multifaceted one, um, but glad that the Green Fighter has already started work to address these and collect this information. Uh, Manjeet, over to you. Uh, thank you. So I think that's that's what we'll address in terms of the social media part. I'm growing old, I think, to 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 now understand uh, that context. So thanks, Anisa. Very helpful. Now uh, coming to the data gap, uh, I think uh, there has been some some good initiatives uh, taken in in many of the the LBC itself. But, but if I have to reflect on 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 the gaps, the the first uh, obviously would be the data generation, uh, and which relates to like among other. The, the, the hydrometeorological station, uh, the, the enhancement of the, the hydrometeorological station because of, and, 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 and make it user friendly or, or make it more technology friendly. Uh, there are real time data stations that can be stilled because it relates with the data collection itself because uh, it's extremely difficult uh, in terms of the data collection uh, when it goes to the extreme events. Uh, when I myself was analyzing the data that I presented earlier, there is a huge data gap for this specific month. Uh, and, and, and when the events happen, when the, when the, when the station, for example, if the hydrometeorological station has been washed away because of the flood or because of the glacier uh, 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 lake outburst, it's not possible to continue with that. And, and, and if you just uh, look at the uh, a very practical perspective, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult even for someone to go and reach up to the data station if the data station are not enhanced and are not technology friendly, the, 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 the real time data station, uh, which are possible nowadays, if, if they are not upgraded. Mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, would be the data processing itself, uh, the capacity to process and then help uh, those data because only having the data doesn't mean anything unless we provide uh, 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 information uh, knowledge from that data to help a, a, a policy process. The, the final point, obviously, and the most important is the data sharing, and it relates to the regional context in, in many of our countries. If we just take an example of South Asia itself, this obviously is a big issue uh, in terms of a, a, a country so not sharing data among, among each other, uh, which obviously is harmful for each of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and because of that, we cannot have a, a comprehensive plan that, that, can, that can address the issue. Because as I said at the beginning of my presentation, these extreme events or the slow on, onset events are not contained by the political border. So there is a strong need of the regional government, the international community to address this. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Much to consider there and regional cooperation in monitoring events that affect the entire region is of course key. Um, and excellent to point out that if you have extreme events, often the monitoring that enables you to track those is wiped out with everything else. Um, so the frustration behind that is very clear. Um, I don't know, Shara, do you want to come in on uh, data collection or caps in that? I to add uh, another point, like it's an also an issue of capacity as well. I mean, recently I'm doing uh, one of my research on climate migration and I somehow I really wanted to have some data on, uh, on Cyclone Alpon and I found it quite difficult to get um, data, I mean, uh, some authentic data related with that. So uh, uh, I, I would like to see the issues more from the capacity perspective as well. I mean, whether the country has the capacity to 
uh, collect all those data, to restore it, to uh, share it with, uh, to the others. Uh, so which is also we need to really take into consideration uh, from the international perspective as well. I mean, to sharing the data, even to collect it, is sometimes it's extremely difficult for countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, or India. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, this is something uh, related with capacity building as well. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, it looks like we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, so we'll go with the next two top ones. Uh, this one is aimed at Manjeet, but I think others can come in as well. Um, so, what will be the right and quick way to address loss and damage in remote countrysides um, of LDCs? And how do we distinguish loss and damage from normal weather phenomenon due to climate change? So, a two-part question aimed at Manjeet, but I think uh, all our panelists are in LDCs, so would all have responses to that. So maybe I'll start with you, Manjeet, though. To... Uh, thank you, Brianna. Uh, as I said earlier, I think we, we obviously don't want to see that situation, uh, but, but we, we, the, the situation is taking us uh, on, on, on a different side. Uh, the way the, the global temperatures are rising, uh, the, the situation that we have seen because of COVID obviously is temporary. Uh, and and, and uh, that's, that's the reason the whole discussion about the green recovery uh, and, and the long-term perspectives are coming up. Uh, for any for any countryside or, 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 or for any any communities in the LDC, uh, I think it will be difficult if, if we put if we see this if we see the loss and damage as something separate uh, than the than the uh, than the interventions uh, that the the agency that the government institutions or any other agencies are doing at that uh, in that community. So unless uh, this is embedded uh, to the system itself, uh, I think that will be key. Uh, in a very practical perspective, uh, without going through the, uh, the the technical or the, the negotiation uh, discourse, for the for the community, uh, the community doesn't care whether this is a community-based adaptation or the result or the uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. It is a loss and damage, or it is adaptation. Uh, the situation has to be addressed, and and I think for them, uh, as I said earlier, we we we. Uh, who are working at, at the global level, who are uh, helping the national policy perspective, uh, I think the, the, the most important, the foremost uh, role is uh, not to get that community to that situation. Uh, and, and, and that relates to the, to the bigger responsibility that we have, uh, is the communities are already directing towards that side. A uh, lot of things that we have discussed earlier, the, the capacity strengthening, the role in terms of the institution helping to address the, the slow onset and the extreme events, uh, the financial support to be provided to those uh, communities, and, and the list goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe Shara, over to you next. Um, the question is, what's the right and quick way to address loss and damage in remote countrysides of any LDCs, and how do we distinguish loss and damage uh, from normal weather phenomena and due to climate change? Uh, from the legal perspective, if I uh, like to give the answer, it would be difficult actually. I mean, unless there is a very strong scientific evidence. But as uh, Dr. Salim already referred that uh, we are currently in a time when scientists were uh, explicitly saying and linking up the things um, uh, with loss and damage. I mean, uh, but uh, from legal perspective, I don't know whether um, this, uh, uh, I mean, this scientific uh, statement that the patients whether it's still or not. Uh, but um, but uh, uh, I'm, I think there is still scope left uh, uh, to do further research uh, to make a clear distinction between the uh, normal phenomena and uh, the extreme weather event to address it as a loss and damage. Uh, and apparently, uh, I mean, it, it would be easy because, uh, I mean, if I say uh, the wildfire in California, um, which is happening due to the extreme level of uh, high uh, temperature, uh, we can definitely, uh, through scientific evidence, we can establish it as a uh, result of uh, uh, loss and damage. So uh, yeah, this is the one part. And another thing is how to access at the remote uh, uh, place of LDCs, I mean, remote countries of LDC. I mean, in that case, um, uh, capacity, I would again uh, emphasize the capacity building of the government. Uh, 
uh, at the national level, uh, at the community level, uh, which will eventually, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, strengthen the capacity of the community at the uh, local level, uh, so that uh, they don't need to wait from the external support and they can respond by themselves at certain stage. So, uh, I mean, uh, from my perspective, I would rather uh, emphasize more on the capacity building uh, side so that uh, community and country can respond by their side. That's what I would like to add. Thanks. Thanks, Shara. Um, and Anesa, I don't know if you want to come in on, on this question as well. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to share um, how, how I think uh, we can address the loss and damage in the remote area, I mean, in the LDC. For me, I think the most sustainable way is to strengthen the uh, reporting system from uh, the community on, in, the remote, uh, in the remote area. Just imagine like having a, um, a stronger administrative system or services where the community are aware of what, the change, what, what are the changes are happening and where we are, we are having a communication system on the national level, where we are incorporating all the voices from different community by, we can have like, if I can say like a watch guard or safeguard or guardians on, on each post of, uh, the, of uh, the remote community where they are located, who are, who are giving us data on a daily basis. And we, we can, uh, on the national level, there's a, a way to capture the, the image of how things are happening and how much our community is suffering. Um, on the on the other side, the difference between the weather effect and the, the loss and damage due to climate change, I think on my point of view, uh, I can I can refer to the example from colleagues from Bangladesh. They said that they experienced the cyclone that was predicted to be happening every 20 years, but in this in this period they kind of they kind of experience it. So it's kind of a, a quick thing that they were not able to cope with. So I think the weather effect is just it's just so friendly. It, it kind of gives you the the the, head, the light. Be like, I'll, I'll be coming in the next five years, three years. You can be actually ready to cope with. But for the the weather change due to climate change, you just sleep, everything is okay. Then you wake up, you just it's a disaster. So there's no no prediction or any warning system that you you are having. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks for bringing up that example again too. The frequency of 50 year storms being every 10 years or 20 year floods being now every other year is certainly not uh, normal weather patterns um, and definitely climate induced, climate change induced. Um, good distinction to keep in mind. Um, okay, I see we have several questions remaining, but we're running out of time. I'm gonna ask the final question that was top voted uh, to the whole panel, but I also invite our panelists to kind of look through the questions that remain on our Google Doc. Um, and some of them are addressed to um, particular panelists. And I don't know if Salim is here with us still, but there's a question addressed to him as well um, on may, if we make the private sector pay, does that allow states to ignore their responsibility, which is a good question. Um, so I'm going to read our final question um, to all the panelists, but then also invite panelists to answer others if they would like. Uh, so the question I'm going to read to everyone is debt relief has been raised as a, as a solution to finance um, in the context of the pandemic associated with extreme weather events in India, Bangladesh and Kenya. Is this also a good solution perhaps for loss and damage finance? Uh, this debt relief question, and that kind of tags on to the private sector question as well. So maybe Salim, I'll give you the floor first to answer some of these. Great, thank you very much, Brianna. So uh, my short answer is all of the above. We should be looking at all the different options that are available and then move forward with the ones that have the greatest potential and support going forward. Now, um, I earlier mentioned the fact that one of the principles that we should be trying to apply is a polluter pay principle. So the polluters are, are quite easily identifiable. As I named a set of companies that are making money out of fossil fuels. They are polluters. Let us see if we can uh, uh, charge them a levy. Um, airline passengers are polluters. Let's see if we can charge them a levy. Um, national governments uh, would obviously also have to play a role, but 
when we speak about national governments and public sector, we are talking about the citizens of those countries. So, you know, the money doesn't come from the prime minister of the country, the money comes from his citizens, which the prime minister then allocates on behalf of his citizens. So uh, it's really where we are uh, uh, making the uh, source of the payment. And in my view, it's morally correct to try and identify the biggest polluters and see if we can make them pay. The role of government is to ensure that we make them pay. Uh, and as I said earlier, governments can agree to do that. There are uh, a maritime pollution laws, for example. Right now, we have a major uh, maritime wreck going out, out outside Sri Lanka. We had one a few days ago outside Mauritius. There is maritime law that applies to this kind of pollution uh, mm. damage that can be applied, and they have to pay. Um, so why can't we have something similar for loss and damage from climate change? We need to think out of the box. Yeah. Great, great response. Thanks very much, Salim. Um, who should I take next? Uh, maybe we'll go to Manjeet. Um, if you'd like to answer the debt relief solution or any of the questions that were addressed specifically to you or you would like to throw in an answer to, you're very welcome. Uh, over to you, Manjeet. Um, thank you. I think uh, in terms of the debt, debt recovery, uh, Salim has already alluded, and I think that's that, that's very important. The the, the situation uh, that we have now, the, the way the discourse has started uh, relating with the, with the pandemic, uh, it's, it's it's obvious because the, the the impact is 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 high in the in the country with with the lower tax revenue and the high public spending. Uh, and and the and the and the current financial system uh, may not uh, be be adequate uh, in terms of helping those countries the way uh, it, it it is now. Uh, so, but but I think that there is a this is a big discourse and, and has to be uh, looked uh, from the climate perspective as well. Uh, how 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 this helps in terms of long term sustainability and, and how it helps uh, the countries so that they don't uh, come back uh, and 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 continue uh, some of those traditional. Uh, interventions uh, to continue with the fossil fuel because if the country continues that in a specific country then uh, we will be the one who will be facing the blunt of of, of loss and damage uh, and and at that moment uh, any 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 scale of finance uh, may not be adequate to to address our needs uh, there is another question that was uh, specific to me about the the quantification of loss and damage uh, i'm also trying to type the answer but but i think uh, it's uh, it's it's important uh, there is a whole discourse about the methodology. Uh, there is also the other part of the story, which is about non-economic loss and damage, which uh, cannot is difficult to quantify. And just if we take an example of the human uh, death, that's 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 something I think is 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 not uh, preferred to be to be quantified. And and the dis the, the discourse is still remain. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Manjeet, for also trying to answer that one as well. And certainly non-economic losses and damages are very real and very difficult to, yeah, put how do you place numbers on human life or the value of sustainable watersheds or crops or any of some of the things that are loss of cultural identity, loss of heritage, grave sites, loss of things that can't be replaced. Um, yeah, certainly something that is a troubling thing to think about. Um, so thanks for taking a stab at that question. Uh, maybe over to Shara and then Aneza for either debt relief question or any of the ones that were addressed to you or you would like to answer. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I'm not going to go with the discussion of the debt relief because what Mandit and uh, Salim Sar says, I totally agree with that. But I would like to address the question that says that, do you think loss and damage need to be an independent form of adaptation in UN climate negotiation? Uh, yes, my answer is, yeah, it should be um, independent. And it sh uh, I mean, uh, when we actually refer loss and damage, uh, we actually refer that uh, when the adaptation is failed, this is the time when loss and damage actually occur. So uh, what I personally believe uh, by being in this process that uh, it shouldn't be considered under the adaptation. It should be taken as an independent agenda item and should be negotiated separately um, beyond adaptation or mitigation perspective. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to address that uh, there should be, I mean, even it was um, 
Ejiman from uh, LDC and G77 China and COP25 to have a loss and damage agenda uh, every year in the COP, uh, a mandatory or a permanent agenda item. So, I mean, yeah, this is uh, what I will definitely support that uh, we shouldn't take uh, loss and damage uh, as a part of adaptation, but we should treat it independently mm -hmm. and we should also negotiate it separately as a permanent agenda. Excellent. Thanks, Shara. Important points. Uh, Anaza, last, last round to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for me, I would like to address uh, two questions that was the that, um, that was into the key question and answer. First, I would like to for, uh, start with the Pacific question, where she, they, I, I don't know if it's a she or the he, but I, I was asked a question where if the youth participation in the negotiation uh, is important. And I can say that, yes, it is important, especially for the youth from uh, the LDC, because we need, we need to capture all the voiceless voice on the table where decisions are being made. And this is, this is a tipping point where the youth need to be on the front line. So the youth need to participate in the COP, not for picture. I don't know why um, there's this stereotype that the youth participation in the COP is just for picture and um, into events, but we can actually participate in, in order to contribute and be decision makers and also to advocate for our community. So I think it's very important that the youth should be represented in the negotiation. And also taking one from Mugabo and Aldo, uh, they asked what is the plan of, uh, of uh, um, having an inclusive youth activity, not only in Rwanda, but um, uh, across, across the globe. I can say that we are currently working with the Global North Youth and the, the Global South Youth in in developing what we are calling right now the loss and damage uh, youth coalition. So it's a group of youth uh, with the with the vision to showcase that we can uh, we can actually act actively contribute in the negotiation as negotiators, but also as actors in our community. We can share story, yes, but uh, but with working with uh, partners such as IIED and ICAD, we can develop our skills in understanding what needs to be done, and we can write project and have like uh, re research in our community being being uh, we can also implement them and also report on them try to see if we are moving from point a to point b what what, what can what uh, what are different measures we need to adopt for the next phase so i can say right now we, we are having a pilot one uh, which will be ending at cop uh, the next cop that's where we'll be the, the first one will be ending and I think from there, we'll be having enough information, enough data on what actually needs to be done in the perspective of the youth, but the global youth in general. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, that's a great answer. And thank you for the question. I'm just reading it now. Uh, that question ended with, uh, I'm excited to imagine the outcome of an event that was hosted uh, entirely by the youth. And having a COP hosted entirely by the youth would be an excellent thing, in my opinion. Um, she's got some stuff done, I think. Um, great. Well, we're at our time. Apologies to everyone whose questions weren't able to be answered in this discussion, um, but we will be sharing uh, this webinar along with some uh, publications about loss and damage that we've put together, uh, including a small pocket guide on loss and damage and other resources. Uh, Anaza's blog as well. So hopefully we can help provide some information that will be there. Uh, and we've also shared in the chat, we'd love if participants could fill out a short survey on the webinar and how you found it. Uh, and we're hoping that it'll be used to help inform future webinars so they can be most useful to you. So all that remains is for me to thank my panelists and my co-hosts uh, for such excellent presentations and for being so generous with your time uh, to our partner ICAD, Salim and Isatek, thank you very much for co-hosting this webinar. To Manjeet, Sara, and Ineza, thank you for your insight and your brilliance and your dedication to this topic. Uh, and thank you all and my colleagues at IID for helping bring this together and all the participants who shared your time joining us here today. So that's it from me. Um, thanks and enjoy the rest of your evenings, afternoons, and mornings. Thanks very much, panelists.